Hello, everyone. Hello. Hi. Good afternoon. Do we still have the energy to do this session today? Yes. <laughs> Yay. Yay. Excellent. Thank you so much. And I know um, we still have a few people coming in from um, the other sessions um, that are running late. So we're expecting for, for people to trickle in um, over the next uh, couple of minutes. Um, and we'll adjust the timing for, for the session as well. But please do feel free to come a little bit uh, closer um, you know, and, and engage with us in the session. Thanks again for, for coming. In the opening speech of the Secretary General of the Kenya Red Cross, Idris Ahmed, on Monday, as you might remember, he mentioned, it is difficult to think about tomorrow. We tend to focus on our current ways and sometimes get stuck. But innovation is thinking about tomorrow, he said, not today, but do not, what we do not have the luxury to wait for five years. The culture of looking into revolutionary ideas and engagement should start now. What a statement to open up the Global Innovation Summit of 2023, and how fitting to set the scene for the session that we have today. Hello, my name is Joseph Oliveras, and welcome. We are in Nairobi, Kenya. I work at the IFRC as part of the Global Cash team, responsible for innovations and information management. And we are joined today by our co-host online, M. Hi everyone, um, I'm in Ottawa, Canada. My name is Emmanuel and I'm the Director of Digital Products at the Canadian Red Cross. We are your hosts today or for today's session on the future of assistance in disaster and crisis. We um, are hosting a joint online and on-site experience. So I also want to take the time to say hello to those uh, joining us via the YouTube link. Great. Over to you, Joseph. We are happy to be here and welcome again. Um, what a way to close also the last three days of intense discussions, collaborative problem solving, learnings and networking with innovators within the Red Cross and Red Crescent movement by looking towards the future on how we can do better to serve the most vulnerable by leveraging innovations. Today we will be joined by STEAM guests who joined us in our sessions yesterday to look into the future of assistance. We also have guests who are leading disaster and crisis responses, digital transformation, um, and colleagues from migration to join us in the discussion. But first, we'd like to invite Caroline Holt, IFRC Director of Disaster, Climate, and Crises Department, who is joining us live from Geneva today to give a few words on why reflecting on the future of assistance is important. Welcome, Caroline. Thank you, Joseph. Great to see you there. Uh, and I like the energy that's coming from the room. I can feel it here. Um, thank you and good afternoon to everybody uh, who's there as well and everybody online. Um, thanks for the invitation to join. This is a critical topic and I'm really happy to be, uh, to be uh, speaking with you today. Because the global humanitarian system is challenging us in a way that it never has before. Increasingly, we need to reach people in difficult and more complex contexts. We need to support those facing multiple and compounded issues and advocate for those who face ongoing crisis long after the attention of the media has turned away. Oh, and by the way, we have to do all of that in a world where humanitarian resources are not enough and where they're not being prioritized enough to meet the needs of those most impacted. We will increasingly face crisis induced uh, and exacerbated by the climate and we will increasingly work with communities who find themselves displaced through no fault of their own. We will increasingly be challenged as our humanitarian space is squeezed and will be tested on our fundamental principles to continue delivering in ways that are dignified and respectful to those who rely upon us and to demonstrate our relevance and impact in the face of increasing competition. The current scale and complexity of needs and the trajectory of the humanitarian system is simply unsustainable. This necessitates an urgent and critical analysis of the manner in which response is designed, the way it's coordinated, the way it's implemented, and the way it's funded. Quite simply, we need to think and act differently. One of the ways that we're already evolving our response is through the use of technology. Opportunities are opening up that are positively disrupting our way of working. 
We've seen an increase in the utilization of digital payments and remote interactions, certainly during the COVID-19 response. The piloting of digital identities for people with no official IDs to ensure that no one is left behind and to enable the continuity of care for people on the move. We've seen remote engagement with affected people through the use of self-registration apps and online messaging tools, such as WhatsApp, in response to the Ukraine crisis. These innovations, many of which, by the way, that have come even in the midst of the crisis, have allowed us to go to scale and they continue to show promise for significant impact in hard to reach places and where we might not have a strong presence. But of course, as we know, with the rise of digitalization, where we see opportunity, we must also be acutely aware of the risks. The responsibility to protect affected people and to manage risk becomes increasingly important in terms of data protection, digital safety and security. We must reflect on these evolving trends, make sure that we harness the potential and fully embrace the idea that the people we serve and how they interact with humanitarian organizations is changing as our world becomes more digitally connected. We've got to look to the future collectively and be prepared to tackle the new complexities of the planet and the evolving crisis and disasters that will face us. But in doing so, we also have a real chance to shape the future that we want. We need to consider the risks ahead and ensure that we do no harm when we employ innovative approaches. We need to insist that we include the affected population at the center of our work, and we need to provide a whole human response that is not based on siloed sectoral approaches. So in reflecting on this future that we want to create, especially by including those most affected at the heart of what we do, it will enable us to remain relevant to communities everywhere, to continue our journey as leaders in humanitarian assistance, to be impactful in our approaches, and most important, for us to be trusted by the communities we serve. I'm really excited to hear the outcomes of this discussion today. I wish you all the best of luck, the participants in the room and those online. Thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline, for those very important remarks. Yesterday, we had two on-site sessions where participants were asked to imagine the future of providing assistance to the people, to people who were made vulnerable by disasters and crises, leading them to be forcibly displaced. Here in Nairobi, we had 35 participants in our session. Raise your hands if, if you were able to join that session yesterday. Got a few. It was a fun session, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, we asked our participants first to reflect on the present. Who are the people they are serving? What are the needs? Uh, what needs do they have? What services their national societies are providing to address those needs? And what technology is being used to support their services? We then hit fast forward to look into the future and we looked at year 2030. We gave them some scenarios and asked similar questions. Who are the people they are serving in this future? What characteristics do they have? And how have their needs changed? What new services are being offered by national societies to address those needs? And what's the interaction like between affected people and their organizations? and the technology that's used to support the assistance provision in this future. We then asked the groups to tell us a story of the future that they imagined, where vulnerable migrants interact with national societies providing services to address their needs along their journey. M. Thanks, Joseph. Um, and in Geneva, we invited 15 members of the Relief Working Group to participate. We had a slightly shorter duration, so we focused directly on the future's reflections with these experts, asking them the same questions as you just mentioned, Joseph, and also uh, asked them to tell a short story about the vulnerable migrants and their interactions with the national societies, providing services in the future. We will be inviting the presenters from each group to share a three-minute pitch on the journey of, their mi of the migrant they envisioned in the year 2030 and the services provided by the Red Cross Red Crescent highlighting key areas that they learned and that we will follow up on to start building towards a future, the future. 
<laughs> uh, year 2030 was used as it's when our current strategy 2030 ends. Uh, it's also when the targets for the UN Sustainable Development Goals have been set. And it's not too far into the future, so it's easier to imagine. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Sam. We will now invite um, uh, our presenters to share their stories um, and their learnings from these future exercise. Um, they will each have three minutes to tell their story and two minutes to share their learnings and actions that they will take back to their national societies, if any. Um, we will show a snapshot of the story that they created using icon cards, drawings, Lego pieces, and colored paper. Our first presenter is Asa Ander from the Swedish Red Cross. The scenario that her group uh, reflected on, looked at the impacts of climate change in a country and the displacement of the people to rural areas where access to technology is low. In year 2030, as envisioned, huge advancements in technology could be seen, but also much larger digital divide, where areas unable to invest in digitalization are at a disadvantage. Climate issues are compounding, making it more difficult to recover and prepare for the next disaster. Over to you, Asa. If we can have the slide up, please, for Asa. Okay, here we are in our local little village. We're doing okay, at least we're at home. And uh, we have some crops, but not a lot. And we have hard weather coming and going. And oh, oh, oh no, here comes the big flood and it really took our whole village away. We have to leave. And we for unfortunately, we're leaving some people behind, but I need to go, we need to go. We go to our neighbors. Let's see where they are and how they're doing in our closest community. Hello, hello. Uh, finally, we meet someone, someone who is, who we know or who has a perspective. Hi, I'm, I'm the Red Cross volunteer here. Can I help you? What's happened? Our whole village disappeared and we don't know what to do. Can we stay here? Well, we'll try to help you, but we don't know exactly what, what we can do for you because we're having a hard time as well. But I'll see if I can get some messages out to my, my Red Cross network if our connection works because it's not so good here. Uh, but at least, uh, oops. <laughs> Somewhere it still seems that the Red Cross network has picked up on that the disaster has happened. So here comes the drone, dropping off some basic supplies, at least to take this local community, uh, let the local community be able to help those who come, come by. But we realize we won't be able to stay here. They won't be able to support us. They don't have enough for themselves. And uh, who knows when this little village goes off the map as well. So we need to start moving. We move on. We've got directions that there's a place where there's a bigger collection, where they have a shelter and uh, a meeting point where we can register and get some more help and maybe get directions for where we should rebuild our lives. So we register, hello, ah, great, thanks. We get some help to start building a new house, start with a shelter, start growing new crops and maybe meet a new community and learn how to integrate in the new place. So that was the story of our little local migrants from the very local rural community that basically isn't even connected. And we realized that in this place, they won't be able to get pretty much anything from any digital support. It has to be done by the people who are already there and with the knowledge the people already have. 
but we can try to direct to another place where there's maybe better possibilities to build for a more sustainable future. And that's where the Red Cross can really make a big difference. At least that's how we built our scenario. Yeah? Great. Thank you so much, Elsa. And in this uh, particular scenario, I think we there was also some innovative um, uh, ideas in terms of maybe having drones drop off uh, packages to areas where, where people are, are so remote and very rural um, to, to get some, some assistance. Thank you, Asa. Em? And thank you, Asa. Uh, we would now like to welcome our second presenter, Maya Toning from the Danish Red Cross, who participated in our session with the Relief Working Group in Geneva. The scenario that they reflected on looked at a political crisis in a country and the displacement of millions of people to neighboring countries in, ur in an urban setting. While millions more were inter internally displaced, including elderly people with disabil disabilities and children who were unable to travel. In year 2030, there's been a greater urbanization and a strong advancement of technology. This includes things like AI, e-cash, and even avatars where communities are strongly con connected via digital means and tech is part of their lives. Government offers a digital legal ID um, with biometrics to access services, but not much is available for migrants. Over to you, Maya. Thanks so much, Em and Joseph, and hi to everyone in the room in, uh, in Nairobi and online. So um, as Em said, to begin with, we didn't have a lot of time, but I'll try to bring forward some of the ideas that came in the, in the consensus that we had in the room around this scenario. It's not so much a story as, as it's a lot of points around some of the technological developments um, that we saw impacting the way we'll respond in the future. Um, and then a lot of uh, reflections around migrants and that also being an increasing crisis that we need to be ready to respond to. And I think some of the things that I'll be going through are tendencies that we already see today, so they should be recognizable for you, but hopefully we'll learn how to address them in more efficient ways in the future. Um, so first of all, when we were talking about vulnerabilities, we overall said we'll, we'll see the same kind of vulnerabilities that we see today, um, and that includes also particularly marginalized groups. It's the women, um, the elderly, child-headed households, people living with disabilities and so on that we're quite familiar with, but we'll also have um, new vulnerabilities added to this, especially around digital access. So even though the world might be connected, maybe it's not everyone who has digital literacy. And in this context that we were um, studying yesterday, we also saw particular groups of migrants who don't, don't necessarily have access to those digital tools that exist because of government restrictions. And there's also a vulnerability in that governments have a power um, to actually close down some of these platforms that people are accessing, for example, in complex scenarios, which is also something we would need to, um, to be aware of and know how that could potentially impact what we are planning. And I think within this, one of the things we discussed was what we see already, that fear of what happens with your online and data, so already people are reluctant to share biometrics, and we've seen worst case scenarios of that, for example, in Cox's Bazaar, with data being shared back to the, to the government of Myanmar, even blockchain as a tool that people don't really understand. They worry about getting um, registered on a blockchain just for the fact that they don't know what happens with that data. And I think it's the same for many of us as well. Still, we, we might not fully understand what it is this techno te these technological solutions can do and how, how will that actually impact how we use them. Um, and I think Caroline mentioned our responsibility on data protection, particularly in the context of this. Misinformation is something that's growing. Uh, again, a tendency we see now and um, there I think that the consensus in the room yesterday also was that the Red Cross, Red Cross movement have a particular responsibility in providing people with information coming from trusted sources. So our already work, like the work we're already engaging in, in terms of like rumor tracking and really building trust with communities that remain really relevant. 
Um, and then, of course, giving people access to means of communications. Again, highest priority when we look at migrants, and that will, that will remain so, and increasingly so when we see more uh, displacement around the world. Legal assistance and information to people about their rights is an increasing need as well. Um, and around all of this, one of the things that was mentioned by one of the other groups was uh, also around the reputational risk to the movement if we are not able to actually deliver the data protection or the trusted information and so on, including also having social media monitoring to ensure that there's not a lot of things happening on social media that we're not um, keeping in touch with. To deliver on this, we need overall digital competencies, so that's something that needs to be built up. I heard uh, just this morning that in the last PEC training that was facilitated, participants immediately started using AI and ChatGPT, which is excellent, starting to test that as tools, but we also need to know how to use them for them to be um, most relevant for us. The PEC training is a practical emergency cash transfers training, sorry about that. Um, and I think then finally, uh, some of the new and emerging learnings besides that that we were talking about was plugging into humanitarian service points, and we'll probably also see more and more of those, part, partly also in the, in the urban settings, that they will be a key for, uh, or a hotspot for where we can deliver some of our services. Collaboration with the private sector, um, that's both on the... Uh, general technological side, some of the things we are already seeing now, but for example, in this scenario, we were also discussing, okay, if the government is shutting access to the internet, to people's connection, do we also need to collaborate with the Elon Musks of the future that are already sending out satellites to provide internet? And how is that then challenging, for example, our neutrality and our role as auxiliary to governments? So even very political discussions like that, we also need to, to start having them. Data-driven decision-making will also be um, key for what, how we are designing our responses in the, in the future. We're increasingly collecting a lot of data. We're mainstreaming how we're doing that. So we'll have a lot that can help us make the right decisions about how to use those limited resources that we will have to respond to humanitarian crisis in the future. And then I think maybe just the final thing that I wanted to mention is the uh, cross-border collaboration between host national societies that we want to see more of. Caroline already mentioned digital IDs as, as one of the enablers of that. I think humanitarian service points could also be an area. And generally, I'm sure the more we digitalize, the easier it is to support people across borders. So I think that was it from the side of Geneva. Uh, very techy. I hope it can serve as an inspiration for those of you sitting in and will be moving forward in your discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maya. <laughs> Just wanted to make a note that since Maya mentioned ChatGPT, we actually use ChatGPT to generate some of these future scenarios. So if you didn't like them, <laughs> blame ChatGPT and AI. Um, we would now like to welcome our third presenter. Emil Berger from uh, the Danish Red Cross, um, again. Uh, the scenario that, that they reflected on their group looked on a new global pandemic, COVID 2.0, and its impact on people, including undocumented migrants in a country. In year 2030, as envisioned, countries have invested in preparedness, including business continuity, but processes and tools have not been up to date. People are more often are more open to remote interactions. However, there's more sophisticated attempts to cause harm online and digitally, um, including cybersecurity, digital um, identity theft, uh, misinformation, and disinformation. Um, if we could have the slide, please. Uh, thank you. And over to you, Emil. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I feel like Maya and Caroline stole most of my talking points, but uh, I'll try to, to summarize um, what, we, what we discussed in our group. Um, so we tried to kind of, within this scenario, sort of zoom in on three different challenges. Um, so one is, as we also saw during the COVID pandemic, these lockdowns and restrictions on movement, um, as this poses certain challenges, um, and also 
could give rise to sort of instability and resistance against these restrictions um, and further exacerbate this with um, increased stigma and marginalization following that. Um, then we also discussed this um, about misinformation and how we also as a government auxiliary uh, role can sort of create the trust that people will actually um, trust the information that we are sharing and the awareness that we are spreading. Um, and um, also these sort of multi-factor threats for uh, especially undocumented migrants. So one thing, of course, would be these, these movement restrictions and lockdowns, but another thing is these extreme weather events that we also see recurring um, and even more over the next couple of years. Um, so what we try to circle in uh, for our, our use of, uh, of Legos and so on is sort of three distinct groups of people in need um, who we would be serving. Uh, so one is, I'm not sure we can see it here, but basically the ones who are able to um, access digital tools that we have to get better at actually supporting them virtually. Uh, one example was the virtual field hospital, um, where again, within these government lockdown and restrictions, people could still get the help they need virtually. Then there was a second group of uh, those who are still staying in the same place, but do not have access to these digital tools that we need to combine this virtual approach with still this community-based outreach um, yeah, services to make sure that we are also bridging the gap for those who are not able to access the virtual services. And then finally, we focused on, uh, again, these undocumented migrants or uh, migrants um, on the move who are being uh, forced to, to move to other places up here for various reasons. Um, how can we ensure and also use technology, for instance, like the digital IDs, to ensure that when they are moving from one place to another, they still have access to the same services and ensure some kind of continuity um, in the services that they are receiving. Um, and I think for us, the two main sort of learnings we also took from this was the need for us as a movement to focus on sort of the, um, the mixing of modalities. So it's not enough just to focus on being able to reach people virtually or digitally because there will always be people who do not have that same access to those services. Um, so that is one thing we discussed. Um, and then also the the complementarity of services. I personally really like this whole, whole human approach where instead of talking about these semi-artificial sectors to actually look at in this scenario within this target group, what are their needs and how can they when we then make sure that, that we can meet um, as many of them as possible, either virtually or through a combination of community-based presence and virtual solutions. So, thank you. Thank you so much. Emma. Thanks, Emil, and thank you to all our presenters. Um, these were just a few of the stories that we heard during our session yesterday, um, but I hope it helps paint a picture of perhaps what we need to prepare in the future. I know that some of the key takeaways for me as this was a, a good reminder of the import importance of uh, designing and building uh, digital solutions, looking at the whole human, um, but also across borders and um, with the end users. So I think it's very important, it's a good reminder, and I think everyone accomplished um, really good work here. Um, I also, one thing that struck me was the mention with um, the private sector and how we might partner with them in the future. I think that's something that I'll take away and reflect on a little bit more. Joseph, what about you? Yeah, thanks, Em. Um, I think there are three things um, on my side. One is uh, I think that the level of awareness um, of people about emerging tech was, was pretty good. Um, I thought so people were able to mention, you know, blockchain, AI. Um, uh, there was a concept, I, I think, with Emil's group around the digital hospital, you know, in terms of being able to receive care, you know, in this remote situation, which is, uh, from my understanding, is actually a reality um, and, and not so much too futuristic. Um, of course, AI for, um, for analysis, but um, also I, I saw in one of the group, um, they mentioned infodemic management. So in terms of um, um, being able to combat mis, um, miscommunication and discommunication, so the idea of, of having us, um, you know, new competencies built um, that as part of, of, 
of our services and how we communicate to, to communities, um, I thought was really good. But of course, as uh, Maya had mentioned already, um, that it's not just about these new tools, it's about you know, the risks that could potentially be introduced also um, in, um, when we're exploring these tools. So being aware of not only what is possible, but also um, balancing that out with, with um, these risks and, and potential challenges. Um, the second um, takeaway for me is um, no matter how uh, advanced we get in, in technology and no matter how much the world changes between now and, and the next seven or, or ten years, I think for all of the groups that we saw yesterday, it was really good to see that they were at, at the heart of it. There was still strong focus on our values and principles. You know, how do we build trust in communities? Trust came, came out, I think, in all of the, the groups that we've seen, um, that we've heard, the um, humanity, you know, um, as technology um, proliferates, is that going to, to replace a human being? And the answer was no. Um, and dignity, you know, how do we provide these services even if, if they are being done more and more digitally or more and more remotely? So it, it was very refreshing to know that we're continuing to, to look at the future but with these um, principles um, in mind. And lastly, um, and Emil and um, also Caroline had mentioned about the, this concept of the whole human response where the idea that, you know, that we shouldn't be looking at one very um, siloed piece of need, you know, a person that might come to you through a humanitarian service point. Okay, what do I have? Uh, okay, I have um, food parcels. Here you go. But the idea is to really reflect on what are their needs and uh, how could we care for them emotionally, psychologically, physically, socioeconomically, financially. So having that more holistic way of thinking um, in our programming, uh, this concept of integrated assistance. M? Yeah, thanks, Joseph. Um, I think we will now move to our Q&A and discussion with our humanitarian colleagues. It is my pleasure to introduce them first. Sorry, first is Stefania Hanfo, who is representing the IFRC Global Migration and Displacement Team in Geneva. And we also have Jamie Nassar, who is IFRC's Head of Emergency Operations. Great. So as, as we have our online guests, um, and over here we have um, our guest as well, Ben Holt, who is um, uh, Futures and Foresight's lead for the IFRC South Reno Academy, um, and Yurian Jar, who, Lar, um, <laughs> who is our director. <laughs> Director of Digital Transformation, um, join us here on site. Um, so um, if you have a question, just please raise your hand and we will um, have someone bring a microphone over to you. We will collect um, questions here um, in a room and then we'll ask um, our guests to, to respond to those questions. Um, if you are online, please write your questions and comments um, or in the comments section of the, the YouTube um, uh, page, and we'll read out your, your questions. Uh, we'll collect them as such. So, um, any questions or reflections, um, comments in terms of what you have heard today or, or your views about, about the future? Anyone in the back room? No question there. Okay. As you reflect on some of, of the, the ideas and, and thoughts that were shared um, by our presenters today, um, maybe I'll ask first um, Stefania, who is representing our IFRC Global Migration um, and Displacement Team, to maybe share a few reflections on her side in terms of um, what she heard from, from, the, from the presenters and how the insights from this features exercise might be helpful in her work um, within the Migration and Displacement Team. Stefania. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Uh, thanks, Em. And hi, colleagues. Uh, absolutely. I think it's a 
it's a great opportunity to be part of, uh, of this conversation and um, I was really impressed by the discussions uh, it was part yesterday and also today. And I think that the three uh, scenarios that um, we have worked on uh, were very realistic and really demonstrate how much the work of uh, the IFRC network is needed and uh, also the importance of adapting our um, work to evolve in uh, context. Many of the solutions proposed are something we already uh, we are already doing through emergency or long term uh, programs and also our way towards an integrated uh, approach uh, in countries or along the migration routes with the objective of not leaving uh, anyone behind and I'm referring to the provision of reliable information, relevant languages, uh, ensuring community engagement in the accountability approach in our work, uh, access to basic services and so on. I think that the scenarios have highlighted how existing challenges could be exacerbated. And I would like to mention just uh, soon to be very fast, um, which are the digital exclusion and uh, data uh, security, but my colleagues have already mentioned them. As a network, I think we have uh, uh, to be mindful not to exclude uh, groups um, who may not have access to understanding how the technology works. Um, and I'm referring specifically to migrants in vulnerable situations, but also marginalized communities. We also have to ensure, and this was something that came up uh, in the conversations, how to ensure that community engagement and accountability approach is embedded in our work and to ensure that our digital solutions are actually following what our, um, the people we serve actually have uh, heavy mind and can be useful for them and uh, it was also something uh, still related of course to this it's trust which many of you have, have mentioned i think we really have to work to continue work to build and maintain uh, trust and actually our ambition and something that many colleagues at national societies of course do as we speak is uh, for example keeping integrating migrants and refugees and idps as part of staff and volunteers and to give them space to influence policies and international spaces. So maybe it would be also good to see how technology could help us in this, for example. And then maybe, um, I think it would be also relevant for the conversation to share with you that we are currently working on the first uh, um, migration, uh, movement migration uh, um, strategy that it will be uh, submitted for adoption at the Council of Delegates in 2024. Why am I saying this? It's important because currently we are running the consultations at different levels, regional and national societies, and most probably considerations on technology and digital sphere will be included. So I think it's very, very relevant for you to know that as well. Um, but very quickly, I also believe that it's uh, that we have uh, really promising examples from our current uh, uh, work that may uh, we may consider to reinforce uh, and also adapt to this evolving um, uh, technology space. And I'm referring to something you already just you already mentioned that are the humanitarian service points. So at the end of last year, in 2022, we had more than 700 uh, humanitarian service points active globally. And currently now, we have more than 500, uh, uh, actually uh, almost 600 humanitarian service points currently active uh, um, to respond to the Ukraine uh, and impact in the crisis, crisis response as part of our federation-wide data, data system. So for who is not familiar with the humanitarian service point concept, very quickly, this is a flagship of our organization and it's a safe space. It could be a gazebo, a tent, um, an equipped van located in a strategic point where any migrants, regardless of their status in the country, can get assistance or be referred to another organization that share with us our same approach to migration, because our approach to migration is absolutely humanitarian. So we have used the humanitarian service points in emergencies, uh, considering, for example, the um, response now to Sudan, also in the long term programs, um, for example, the global based migration program. We have example of humanitarian service point used in climate related displacement. We had a uh, case uh, scenario actually on uh, climate uh, related displacement. And the example comes from the Honduran Red Cross, for example, where they coordinated with the Guatemalan Red Cross uh, to activate humanitarian service points along the migratory routes uh, back in 2021. Um, and then uh, um, maybe something I think it would be relevant to share with you is that we are also um, exploring ways to integrate uh, cash and vouchers assistance into humanitarian service points. We are currently evalu evaluating the possibility of a pilot exercise in Europe 
with the support of our colleagues from British Red Cross and the Cash Hub. And um, yeah, and again, we have uh, um, other really beautiful examples of our um, work with the technology. Um, for example, digital community engagement and accountability. This comes from, uh, we had really promising examples from the Ukraine response. Thanks to our colleague from the 510 Initiative and the Netherlands Red Cross. And I'm referring specifically to the social media uh, listening and the helpful information uh, web app. And this, of course, will complement what was already mentioned, like the self-registration app and the digital ID examples in East Africa. So just to conclude, I think that also technology can be really considered as something uh, um, crucial for our, to increase our cross-border uh, cooperation among national societies because we, I, really, we, we have to remember that we are part of a network of 191 national society and uh, um, technology could really help us to work better as a coordinated manner in, as national societies as part of a network so for example through enhanced cooperation exchanging the, the data and insights it's really the moment where we can provide a collective support um, so I hope I've kept the five minutes that were allocated to me. It was very fast, um, but yeah, I think I will pause there just to uh, give space yeah, for my other colleagues to, to share uh, their contributions and also to give space for the questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stefania. Um, really important to, um, to reflect on this. And we specifically selected scenarios that are around migration and displacement because we understand that the, the, the people that made vulnerable um, because of crises and disasters as they move through um, that their vulnerabilities change and so therefore in their interaction with humanitarian organizations such as us um, will potentially change as well so we're really keen as to how that and the thinking from from this exercise futures exercise could help influence that um, strategy that, that you um, um, and your team have been um, trying to promote and imp implement. So thanks again. Um, maybe we'll turn over to Jamie Lesur now, who is um, our IFRC head of uh, emergency operations and has been, um, um, he's led you know, some of the, the biggest uh, recent disasters and crises uh, that we know of. And so it's really um, important to ask someone who, who's been on that front line working with national CITES, providing various different of assistance. Jamie, how is this um, exercise, this future um, reflection, helpful um, from an emergency operations and, from, uh, and for your work? Thanks, Joseph. Uh, and that's, that's quite the introduction. Um, First and foremost, what I have to say is that I really appreciate the, the comment that there's a high level of awareness um, from these, these various scenarios. Um, my wife has recently introduced me to TikTok. I think I'm well behind in terms of my digital literacy. And so to know that there are others out there who are forward thinking is important. Um, why do I say this? Uh, what I represent is is part of the emerging leadership community and the, the head of emergency operations program has the developing HEOPS program, which tries to help emerging leaders to become, uh, well, their true selves in terms of emergency operations. And when we look at how we model this program and how we think about the future, you know, there are known knowns. There's things that we do know. There are known unknowns and there's things that we don't know. Uh, but most importantly, there are unknown unknowns. Who would have ever thought that in, in 2005, Facebook would have had such a splash? Uh, who would have thought maybe in 1997 that the internet would have had such a splash? Uh, what's most important in the coming years is to recognize that things will change the way we operate. Um, I remember, I, I spent most of my career in Africa, going into rural Zimbabwe, going into rural South Sudan, going into rural Kenya. Every, most go-go's out in the tukuls out there have a phone. They have access to some level of digital literacy, some level of communication capacity. This is new, it's innovative, and it's an opportunity that we have that can instantly change the way we do assessments, the way we do community engagement, the way we do beneficiary registration. But there will be evolutions in our system that will fundamentally change the way we work. Uh, and so what's important from the leadership perspective, as, as, as humbly as I might say so, it's about our ability to change and adapt to those 
new innovations as they come up. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to, to the Solferino Academy, who put out a fantastic piece of research on humanitarian leadership for the future. And the quote that I want to talk is, leadership is perhaps the most single important feature in whether or not our organization will successfully embrace innovation and be open and adaptable to changes within the humanitarian environment and quick to engage with the Elon Musks of the world who are putting up Starlink that has an immense opportunity and an immense ability to change the way we can interact with the community is an important part of how we should see ourselves as a humanitarian community. We don't know what's going to come. I'm not sure what the next TikTok is going to be. However, our job is to be open and willing to take those on board and use them to the best ability. Now, I say this with a level of caution, because when I was in my previous career as a jazz musician, my professor in university often said, uh, kiss, which is keep it simple, stupid. So if I ever got too complicated on the drums, she would hold up a sign saying kiss. As we move through the digital technology revolution, as we go forward, it's also about keeping it simple going back to basics and relying some time on what the mixed methods that, that our colleague mentioned. Sometimes it will have to be a bit of both. Where we're looking for, we're using the latest, but it might also be some of the things that we've built our humanitarian system on. And I think that's an important thing to recognize. Innovation and, and the future is, is the way we need to look, but it's built on a foundation. Our ability to effectively adapt and evolve and work within that system is what's gonna make us or break us in the future. Back to you, Joseph. Great. Thank, thank you so much, uh, Jamie. Um, a, a lot of uh, things to, to consider um, from an emergency operations perspective. Um, maybe one last um, uh, reflection that we'll ask um, the, 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 the lead on um, futures and foresights, Ben Holt, in terms of his observations from yesterday um, and how this might be useful for others as well, um, not just in the assistance, but um, yeah, maybe just a, a, a few, few key takeaways um, based on your observations yesterday, and we will move into closing. Thank you, Joseph. Um, I'm always really impressed when we do these sessions, how quickly people think themselves into different possible futures, consider different options for action, and start to deal with some of the challenges that we're going to face or we could face in coming years. The people who make genuine change in the world are always future focused, whether or not they would call themselves a futurist or a foresight specialist, because they're asking hard questions, challenging questions, and they're trying to find a way to solve or to answer those questions. And that means that they're moving forward. They're trying to bring something into existence, to change something, or to improve the way that things work over time. So I think that it's important that we build the time into the work that we do to look upwards, to look outwards, to consider the possibilities, to look for those new options for action, to face those new challenges early, and then to work together to find the solutions that are gonna help us to survive and to thrive and to meet those challenges. And it's always amazing to see all the brilliant brains, the wonderful people from around this network doing that together, at events like this, in workshops that we run all over the place. So yeah, it's been a real pleasure to hear the ideas, to help to um, give people space to generate them, and I really look forward to continuing to see where they go. So thank you. Thank you, Ben. And with that, we are now going to close, and as part of that, we will ask Jurian, <laughs> our Director um, of Digital Transformation at the IFRC, to give us the closing remarks. Yeah, very quick, because I saw the five minute sign up already uh, that we have left, so that's probably now down to two and a half. So I will keep it very quickly. I think everyone has been hearing already that needs change and that we're moving into a more digital world with many opportunities. We do have an IFRC digital transformation strategy which really responds to this change. 
And were we saying that our ultimate objective is to increase the speed, the relevance, the skill, and the quality and the sustainability of our work and our service delivery? Um, so I won't go into all the points that were mentioned earlier, but I just want to put one little thing on the table, just more as a, a thing as I found as a dilemma and where digital meets sort of the content, the, what we what we want to relay. And this is about that misinformation and disinformation in the pandemic. And what we of course saw is that it went very fast in its scale, all that information across the globe, and it has actually quite polarizing impacts and where people felt also excluded. Um, and I think what we need to be aware of also is whatever we say, whatever we do, also has that enormous skill and impact. So working together with digital uh, colleagues and people who understand the solutions, understand how these technologies can amplify our work in any manner, and working really closely collaboratively with the teams that are sort of under that understanding on what is behavior change or what is the message, what, is the, what do we really know and not? Um, and I felt sometimes there we need to really work and balance these two things in the right manner. And that's going to be the main challenge, I would say, is where we really go into intense collaboration. And we know we have enormous tasks ahead of us. Tech is moving incredibly fast. So to keep up, we need also to continue to invest in that capability and prioritize. Um, but never forget our fundamental principles, never forget we really have to consider do no harm because things go fast and really making sure that we have the time and the energy and the resource to also engage in the human in it with human interaction. Because it's not a, a replacement digital, it is um, a complement actually to ensure that we also increase and improve and deliver quality in our human interactions because those will be needed um, for multiple days and years and decades to come. Joseph, thank you very much. And uh, M, maybe just to close with our online friends. Yeah, sure. Uh, so thanks, Yurian. Uh, those were encouraging words and we look forward to continuing this. Um, so we do hope you found this inspiration in what's been presented today. Thanks again to our guests, Caroline, Stefania, Jamie, Asa, Maya, and Emil. Thank you also to Solferino Academy for giving us the space to convene, um, and our friends Ben, Heather, Patricia, Tanmoy, Innocent, and Lara, who supported us in these sessions. Um, and thanks also to Switch for the live stream. And um, I think that on that, we will close for today. So um, goodbye from Nairobi and goodbye from Ottawa. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.